Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Dr. Heather Snyder. She is the Vice President of Medical and Scientific Relations for the Alzheimer's Association. So thank you for joining me today, Heather. Thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. So our first topic today is one that's been near and dear to everybody's hearts over the past 18 months or so, is COVID-19's association with long-term COVID, excuse me, cognitive dysfunction and the acceleration of Alzheimer's disease. And at first, I I think I've, like most people, are kind of over COVID. And I wasn't interested in this topic as much, but then I started thinking about it some more. I'm just going to jump into the hard question first. And I'm wondering, have we learned anything in the past year, which I know in research terms is not very long, about the brain and viral infections? Yeah, no, great question. And and one of the things that we are learning with so the virus that causes COVID-19 is, is um, there's still a big question as to whether it gets into the brain or when it's how it's impacting the brain, whether that's direct, meaning it's getting into the brain and, and acting directly on uh, the, the processes of the brain, or whether it's indirect. So that might mean that it's causing an immune response. It's actually uh, impacting the, the barriers, are what we call the blood-brain barrier, the barrier that protects our brain, which might make then other things that are not good for our brain be able to get into the brain. So there's a lot of emerging evidence that suggests that its impact, that COVID, the virus that causes COVID-19, its impact on our brain may actually be more indirect uh, and, and acting in these ways, uh, influencing and or, or then maybe impacting our brains and um, uh, ability for its various processes. And we're seeing that play out in changes in behavior, changes in cognition, memory uh, over time. And, and how long that lasts, whether that's reversible, those are still questions we don't know, but that's some of what's being researched today. That's fascinating. Was that research, was the research into viral infections and Alzheimer's ongoing, or did it just kind of pop up with the the COVID virus? There have been, I think, historically, we've seen studies here and there that have seen an association of different viruses and, uh, and an increased risk in later life of Alzheimer's, although exa- those have been associations, and we haven't really been able to untangle a cause and effect. So they've, they've been, um, it's, it's been very unclear, and, and how you do that has also been a challenge, because in some instances, 80 or 90 percent of all people have these viruses in their brain, and so how do you know that, that perhaps one, that it's causing uh, the, some of the downstream or the biology changes in Alzheimer's in one person, but not in another? Or is it that you're seeing these, these viruses in the, in the brains or activated in the brains of people with Alzheimer's because you're also seeing changes in the immune system and, and the, the, the ability of the brain to, um, to stave off some of that, that activation? So there's been a lot of questions. I'd say the pandemic and COVID-19 gave us an unwelcome opportunity that we could start asking some of these questions in a, in a different way and, and really try to be answering these questions as soon as possible. Yeah, I did say mostly because the isolation, the lockdowns, all of the mitigation effects or things that we did to mitigate the disease last year really did not help our older population whatsoever. And so I said, well, there's gonna be a plethora of evidence to sift through and, and research going forward, which like you said, is a, was an unwelcome jump into that. But you know, now we have a pile of evidence we didn't have before. So for better or worse, we, we've got that. Um, so tell me a little bit more about like the blood brain barrier. Do we know, like I've, I've heard of it, I understand it, but I don't think I understand it very well. Like I said to my previous um, AAIC guest, I'm more artist than scientist, so I'm very fascinated with brain research, but I don't think I could do it very well. <laughs> but do we? How do we know like what can and cannot get past the blood-brain barrier? Because like, is this something like yeah. we shall understand maybe to help our brain health? 
No, oh, really great questions. And so if you think about it, I mean, it's a really sophisticated biochemical barrier. I mean, you can almost think of it as a, a wall that's protecting our brain from things that might be in our bodies or that might harm our brain. Um, and, and that's really because our brain is our control center, right? So it's controlling our every process. And, and so we need to protect it and keep it as healthy as, as it possibly can to do all of those processes. But it's a, it's a biochemical, a very sophisticated biochemical barrier that allows only certain things into our brain that helps our brain with its processes and its activity and its, its overall functioning. Um, but as we age, we do see that there are changes in our blood-brain barrier, and, and that's normal aging. But in Alzheimer's and in other brain diseases, we see that accelerated or we see that the, the, um, uh, those changes actually increased in a way where things that maybe shouldn't be getting in our brain are able to get into our brain. And, and exactly how and what big questions to ask, exactly what's happening or what that breakdown is, there's a few teams that are working on that right now. And, and in fact, some funding from the Alzheimer's Association to a research team at the University of Southern California is doing just that and trying to say, okay, we know there are changes in the blood-brain barrier. Do those changes actually come before or after some of the other brain changes in, that somebody in, with Alzheimer's may have. And so do you see a buildup of the amyloid plaques or the tau tangles before or after you see these changes in the blood-brain barrier? And, and what could that connection be? So asking some of those big questions. Big answers. Hopefully we'll find them soon, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So did, did the study return any results about why people living with Alzheimer's may have had like a more rapid decline or is that just sort of an ancillary findings? Because that's what I've seen is I know of a few people living with some form of dementia, got COVID and it just like exploded their progression, which is horrible, but also fascinating in a really dark way. Did, did they, did they find any reasons for that or were they just kind of not paying attention to that part? So in, in these studies that are being presented at, at AAIC this year, what we're actually looking at is the impact of COVID and, the, and kind of the long term. Do we see changes in behavior, memory, and thinking? And some studies are now showing, and, and some of those that are being presented are showing that there's actually some biology that's changing too. So you see changes in some of the, um, the under, or some markers of biology that's associated with the cells that are dying or, or which is, you know, the kind of the progression of the disease or, or some of the disease Alzheimer's specific brain changes as well. Now, what this means in terms of does it reverse itself? Is it something that it happens and then your body's able to recover? We don't know yet, but that's, that's certainly one of the questions. One of the other questions are, do you see these brain changes because individuals already have some of the underlying biology and you're seeing an acceleration? And, and we don't know that answer. But on the other side, um, to, your, to your question around people with Alzheimer's, there was a really large study that was presented earlier this year uh, from the, a team in, in, uh, at Case Western in Ohio that looked at medical records and showed that individuals that had dementia were more likely to develop COVID. And, and so really, uh, and that actually uh, uh, African-American black individuals that had dementia were even more likely to uh, develop COVID than white individuals that had dementia. And so really thinking about underscore of the health disparities that both COVID and Alzheimer's uh, that we see in both of these instances and, and really raising that as something that we need as a, as a society, as a community to be addressing, both raising awareness and then ensuring that we have, that we're addressing those disparities going forward. So was this just an extra special virus that just gave us all this extra information to study? Or do we think that there are other viruses that didn't spread as globally as COVID that could also have similar effects? Like what was it? Um, SARS and yeah. Ebola. Yeah, is it Ebola? So there is the SARS, which was another uh, uh, SARS and, and the MERS pandemics. Uh, they, they were not as widespread. They had slightly different properties in terms of their um, uh, their infections and, and what that looked like. But we did, there were reports in individuals following those pandemics that experienced those viruses. We did see a, an increase in reports of people with um, uh, behavioral issues like sleep disturbances, anxiety, and some of those issues. And, and there were also an increased reports of cognitive issues as well, which really was actually was why the research team at the University of Texas San Antonio approached the Alzheimer's Association last spring to say, this is the trends we're seeing very early. 
we don't know if this is going to be similar, but we think we should be bringing people together to ask that question. And, and actually, we, we formed an international consortium to start saying, how can we all be asking questions in a, in a similar way? How can we be collecting data and get the information as soon as possible globally about what the impact of this virus may be? And a lot of that was really based on learnings from these, these past instances. This is really fascinating. It's great that everybody could come together. So what does this study tell us that we should do to help maintain our brain health as we move forward in life? Obviously, not getting COVID is a good start. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a big one. Don't get COVID and you know if you're not vaccinated, get vaccinated. If you do get COVID, take care of yourself, particularly in your your cardiovascular health and it, as well as your overall health. But I also would underscore that having COVID does not mean that you're going to experience these cognitive changes or these underlying biology changes. We don't know why one person may experience them and one person may not, but it is really important that if you do experience, you are experiencing these symptoms or you are experiencing any changes, that you have that conversation with your healthcare provider and that you, you bring that forward as part of your overall care. And do we need to worry about any other like other viruses or should we just focus on this one and avoiding it? I think in general, keeping your health, you know, keep, you know, hand washing your hands and, and staying home when you're sick and, and keeping yourself as overall healthy as you can be is really the best thing you can do for your, your overall body and brain. Well, I hope everybody learned that one last year. If they didn't, well, there might not be much hope for them learning that one, which also we were talking about how all these different researchers kind of came together to ask questions the same way so we could gather data the same. I think that's the I think that's the appropriate way of putting it. Which brings me to our next topic, which is improving diversity in Alzheimer's clinical trials. And I think that many of us learned watching the creation and rollout of the COVID vaccine why that's important. Um, why is it important in Alzheimer's research? There we go. <laughs> like I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the, the unfortunate trends is that we have seen in that we don't have the diversity that's really reflective of our communities in clinical trials, that in order to ensure that a treatment or a tool for early diagnosis is going to work in all populations, in all communities, we need to be including all populations and all communities in our trials as well. And, and that's, I think, increasingly important, especially when we're talking about the health disparities that we see in Alzheimer's uh, in, in terms of that. Uh, black African Americans are two times more likely to develop Alzheimer's. Latino Hispanic individuals are one and a half times more likely. So, how do we we make sure that we have tools and that when we have treatments that they're uh, appropriate for all populations? Yeah, that must be a, a huge challenge. And so, what insights did we learn recently that will help increase participation in these underrepresented ethnic groups in clinical trials? Because again. I think we have a lot more awareness of clinical trials after the COVID vaccines creation, but that's just me. I'm in this world, so maybe other people weren't paying attention. Well, no, I would say, you know, we used to spend a lot more time talking about what phase one was, what phase two, what phase three are, but I think as we've seen this really play out on the main stage as it, as it relates to the pandemic, uh, there is this, you know, that there is an aw greater awareness of the need for volunteers. And we certainly need to tra translate that into action. Uh, and in particular, in, in the Alzheimer's and related dementia space of, of getting volunteers and having people in uh, the studies. And, and maybe before I even kind of go with some of what we learned, I just know that there are so many types of studies that are out there. There are studies that are for people that are living with, that already have cognitive issues. There are people, there are studies for people that are providing care. There are studies for people that perhaps had a family member or a parent. There are studies for people that just want to move the science forward. It's, there could be things that are about perceptions of disease. There could be studies that are for individuals that are cognitively unimpaired that, you know, are, are um, that's really looking at the safety of a particular intervention or, uh, or, or tool. So there's a lot that's out there and, and we can all be part of that solution. And in fact, the Alzheimer's Association offers a tool called trial match at alz.org. So you can be part of that conversation and part of that solution and find the clinical trials in your community. It's, it's really like a matching service for clinical trials where you can go on, you fill out your profile, you get your matches, and then it's really up to you on, on what might be the right fit for you. Um, and I, I think that that's, a, that's an opportunity that we all have. And, 
And some of the research that we did that is being presented at AAIC looks at that uh, Black, Latinos, and Native Americans were significantly more likely to volunteer for a clinical trial if they were asked by a person of their same race. And when you look at the reasons for why people um, or, or why, why, why someone might participate in a trial, the number one reason is I was asked. So, you know, really making those links in, in terms of being asked, being in the community, being present, and, and having those types of conversations and the awareness is really important. Well, I have a quick story you'll appreciate. My very first night at the Alzheimer's Association's Caregiver Support Group was a researcher from University of California, Davis, which is not far from me. She heard my story, which is my mom had Alzheimer's. Now at this point, she, my mom passed away in 2020, but she had it for 20 years at least. My maternal grandmother had cognitive decline, probably because of a brain aneurysm that leaked for three months, but the, she may have also had other undiagnosed dementias. The jury is out on that one and we'll never get clear diagnosis of what was exactly wrong with her because she's also gone. But my maternal great grandmother also had dementia. And this gal from UC Davis looked at me and wanted me for her study so bad. There was just one small problem, not old enough. <laughs> and being in your 50s and being told you're not old enough for something is really kind of weird. So I am part of trial match, though. That's great. That's great. Well, and I do think that one of the things that, you know, um, the Alzheimer's Association certainly has funded a number of new clinical trials, including uh, including some in your backyard. Um, and, and I think we are seeing really a, an incredible diversification increase in some of those early phase trials, those phase one trials that are looking at a number of different biologies and potential therapies that are targeting that really complex biology that we see in Alzheimer's and other diseases. So there's really, there's a, a huge need for volunteers to be in trials. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so find out about trials that are in your community, but also it's, it's on the research community to be in your community and asking that, asking those questions and engaging the community in that conversation. Now, is there a gender dispar di di disparity? Yes, I did have the right word in the research or is it generally pretty even to male and female at this point, just not diverse ethnically? So it depends on the trials. I think we do tend to see that women um, uh, more often are volunteering for trials uh, over men, but you know, we, it does just somewhat depend on the study. It is worth noting that of the more than 5 million Americans that are living with Alzheimer's, more two thirds of those are women. So we also see that there's a greater number of, of people, women that are living with Alzheimer's uh, at this point in time as well. So what are the new outreach tools that we can look forward to being implemented? I read that, that you guys are coming up with new outreach tools for these underserved communities. And so I'm curious, I'm not in a yeah, very no. diverse location, so I might not see them. <laughs> Our colleagues at the National Institute on Aging have developed tools that can be available to researchers all around the country that really allow them to personalize the messaging to the community that they're engaging. And, and that really, again, it's one of the top reasons that people participate in trials is because they were asked. And so how do we have tools and messaging that really is that resonates with the community? And, uh, and so this is going to be a great resource that's going to be available to researchers to use as, as they're engaging the community in their research, because again, there's a huge need for volunteers across all the types of studies that are out there. Which is why we should all consider checking out Trial Match and participating. Are there any other tools for connecting with uh, research studies? Or is that the best one? Uh, I'd say Trial Match is, is really the most user-friendly tool. Trial Match pulls data from other resources, such as clinicaltrials.gov. So, you know, people are certainly familiar with that tool, but sometimes it can be a little bit more challenging to navigate, and Trial Match hopefully is a more user-friendly experience with that allows you to, to, um, to navigate and to identify trials that are within your community and that you might be a fit for, or the person that you're seeking a trial for might be a fit for. And they do do some online studies. I've seen Absolutely. those. Absolutely. I generally Absolutely. And you don't can get connected to some of those as well. <laughs> yeah, I generally don't qualify because I guess apparently I'm not old enough. <laughs> there are studies though. I mean, I think increasingly as we understand more and more about the disease, there are studies. Some of the online studies go from age 18 up. There are other studies that are enrolling people that are in their 50s. I think it depends somewhat on maybe your location and whether the study is in your, is in your community or in your backyard. 
Well, I can attest to trial match is definitely user friendly. I am not a person that likes to have, I don't want to learn how to use your tool. It, you know, it's like if I can, be I'll learn, I'll learn, right. yeah, well, yeah, if it's easy and I could just kind of jump in and do it great. If I got to spend a bunch of time figuring out how to make it work and this goes across the board for all tools, if it's not intuitive and easy, I've been a Mac Apple computer user since damn, 1982. So me too. Just, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have not met somebody I, else. The little, uh, the little, the little um, Mac me. Classic was my, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I was a sophomore in high school back then. Oof, that was a way, little ways back. But yeah, if it's not intuitive, it's like I don't have time to like, you know, Google and figure out. And I mean, I'm a reader, but no, it's just if you want my help, make it easy. And Trial Match definitely makes it easy. That's and great. So yeah. I will make sure to start sharing that link more often. Is there anything else we should know about helping increase diversity in trials, participating in trials that we should leave the listeners with? I think this is something that we, you know, both in whether you volunteer or whether, it, you know, even if there's not a trial that's maybe a great fit for you, is continuing to share your story, be part of the conversation, whether that's advocating, walking in your local walk to end Alzheimer's and raising awareness in your community. I see your flowers in the in the back. Uh, uh, raising awareness in your community about the cause and, and about your story and being raising that volume of, of the conversation is, is so incredibly important. And uh, we're just we're thankful for you to share these stories and share this research with your uh, with your audience. Well, I appreciate you sharing much of your precious time with us today. I look forward to learning more of what comes out of the conference, the Alzheimer's Association International Conference. And that'll happen while I'm on vacation. And so I'll get to catch up with you guys all when I get back. That sounds great. We look forward to it. Thank you so much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.